Okay, so you clicked on this video to find out how to create 3D assets for your game. And I will come to this very quickly, but first there are some things I need to mention. First of all, I will focus in this video on Godot and Blender. However, most of what I will say is very basic, so it's also true for other 3D software as well. So if you like to use some other program at some point in your workflow, you should actually be able to and hopefully still find this video helpful. And second, this video will for the most part not be a follow along step by step tutorial. Instead, my goal is to teach you the basic principles and show you a way of doing something so that you can adapt it and change it to fit your personal needs. I will try to keep everyone on the same page, but if you are a complete beginner and did not use any 3D software at all yet, you may will feel a little bit lost. Okay, I guess that's enough for introduction. Let's start with the basics. Because before I can start talking about workflows and stuff, I need to introduce some very important principles. The first one is UV mapping. The concept of UV mapping can best be visualized when thinking of a cube out of paper. You can cut along its edges and unfold it, so you can draw on it. If you fold it back together, you have a painted 3D object. Kind of. Of course, we can do a similar thing in Blender. It's called UV unwrapping. This cuts your 3D object into flat pieces that can be laid over a texture. If we now select a color, we can start painting on the texture and it will map to the 3D object. Even cooler, in Blender we can also draw on the 3D object and Blender will map this to our 2D texture. However, one problem with this is that you are limited by the texture size and big textures take a lot of memory space. But if the texture gets too small, things start to get quite pixelated. This can especially be problematic at the edges of a face. As you see, the color can overlap on other faces if the texture size is too small. So one approach to avoid this is to, instead of mapping the texture to the geometry, do the other way around and map the geometry to the texture. This may sound confusing at the beginning, but please stay with me. I will explain you what I mean in just a minute. So you can see our texture on the left side. This is actually just a few colors. The tricky thing is that we can actually move each face of our geometry individually so we can select each face of our object, scale it so that it fits into the color we want it to be. We can even scale it to zero and then move it to the wanted color. On this way, we can get totally seamless edges with a texture that can actually be just a few pixels big. The best real world reference I could come up for this would be to cut our cube into pieces, then crumble each piece together and throw it into a can of paint. When we pull it out again, each face will be colored completely in one color and can be patched together to a 3D cube. One of the downsides of this, of course, is that you can no longer freely draw on the object since there is no space on the texture anymore. Another important thing we need to talk about are the material settings, or more specifically the PBS or Principles BSDF shader. This is a standardized way of describing how a 3D object should look, or in other words, what kind of material it should be made of. This PBS shader is implemented in one form or another in basically every modern 3D software. So defining material properties for an object in this way will ensure that you get similar results when importing it to another software, like in a game engine. Of course, this will not be an in-depth tutorial on PBS shaders. Make sure to check out other videos for this. So here just very quickly the basic parameters that you can play around with. First, there's the base color. Obviously, this is setting the color that the material will have. Then we can say if the surface of the material should be metallic or not. This is an either or decision with nothing in between. The actual amount of how reflective the surface should be is controlled with the roughness parameter. You can change this to anything between completely perfect mirror and completely shattered light without a clear reflection. Last thing I will mention is the emission parameter. Here you can say if the object should actually emit light instead of just reflecting light from another light source. You can choose the color and the brightness or strength of the emitted light. A very useful thing is that each of these inputs can also be a texture or an output of a node in Blender. 
Maybe you already start seeing where this is going to. Okay, so basics done. Now let's talk about how we can use this in a workflow. First we need a suited 3D model. This approach works best with overall simple models with flat shaded faces. Just like we did earlier with the cube, we can set up a texture with a nice color palette with colors we can choose from. This can easily be done by plugging the texture into the base color input of the PBS shader and then use the UV coordinates of the object as input for the texture. I would also recommend to set the texture interpolation of the image texture to closest. Otherwise Blender will mix two colors of the texture together and it will never be the actual color from the image. Now we can select our object and press U to UV and wrap it. Just like in our example with the cube, we can now select the faces we want, scale them down and put them onto the colors we want them to be in the UV map. Just remember, whenever you want to colorize a specific area, you need extra geometry in there. You cannot map the faces partly to one and partly to another color. If you want to colorize details differently to the rest, you need to actually create geometry for these details. Of course, you can also use this to set other parameters of the PBS as well. For this, you can create multiple sets of the same color palette in the same image. Then you use different images to mask out what part of the palette should influence the metallic parameter, which part should influence the roughness and so on. Let's take a closer look to the metallic mask. You can see that this is actually just a black and white image saying that everything in the bottom right texture should be full metallic and the rest should be no metallic at all. So if we switch back to the color texture again and I select the color in the bottom right quarter of the picture, you can see how it changes the color and become metallic for the selected parts. This also works with emission as you can see. The only difference here is that I actually set the color directly with the second texture instead of masking it with a black and white image. So with this you can set up your own color palette and get creative. If you are happy with the result you can export it. I would recommend using the GLTF export format for this because I think this is the future. In Blender you can pretty much leave the default setting as they are. But I like to only include the selected object in the export and apply modifiers before exporting. Now let's check how it looks in Godot. Let's set up a little scene with nice lighting where we can place our 3D models in. You can import your GLTF files by just dropping it into your project's file structure. Let's take a look at it. Looks fine. So we can save this as a new scene. And finally import the new scene to our test level. You can place it anywhere, maybe attach some script to it and check how it looks. One last thing we should do is to fine tune the imported material in Godot. So select the materials in the project's file system, open the LB to tab, this is what's called base color in Blender and uncheck the filter tag. This would be the same thing we did in Blender when setting the color interpolation from linear to closest. Make sure to set this in every other parameter of the PBS shader that you used as well. For the lighting you can also increase or decrease the intensity if you want. The good thing about this approach is that you can actually use the same material for everything. So this tweaking is something that you only need to do once. Overall you can use this workflow to create a huge set of assets very fast. For example there is a famous Infancy who almost perfected it and created whole asset sets in just 10 minutes. You can use this approach also in higher poly models but I think it works best when used with a charming low poly style. Don't be afraid to make complete games in this look. You can create very cool looking worlds. However, at some point you may find it somewhat limitating, especially if you try to achieve something different from this low poly look. So let's check if we can make it a little bit more advanced from here on. My goal is not to reach photorealism, but the models could be a little bit more detailed as the last one. So this workflow works best with higher detailed models and a smooth shading. So let's change the shading in Blender from flat to smooth. You can see how it instantly looks like it has more polygons. Now switch to texture paint mode and from there create a new texture at the right side of the screen clicking the little plus sign. Now if we select the color we can start drawing. I would recommend to first start like with the low poly approach and select faces you want to give a different color in edit mode. Then use tab to switch back to draw mode and select the little icon on the top to mask out all not selected faces. Now you can only draw in the selection. Use the filling tool to fill out the selection with the selected color. Use this method to give your object a base color without much detail. When you feel good with it, start drawing in nice little details like dirt on the edges of the model. Remember you can draw in other PBS parameters as well by setting up a texture for this too in the shading tab. If we now switch back to draw mode and select for example the metallic texture, 
we can draw in with white a mask that sets some parts of the model to be metallic. Of course you can also use multiple textures to draw in more than one layer, like one for base color and one for details. For this just create a new image texture in the shading tab. Make sure to turn down the alpha for this completely. Now connect these two layers with a mixed RGB node. Use the alpha value of the detail texture as factor. And make sure to plug in the texture in the right order. Switch to draw mode and select the details texture. Now if we draw onto the model we actually draw into another layer and we don't mess around with the others. You can create as many layers as you want, but as soon as you have more than a single image as input for your PBS node, you will need to bake your textures before exporting. For this simply create a new texture image, make sure it is selected and for now baking is only possible in cycles, I sure hope this will change soon. So switch to cycles render engine, you can see baking popping up, open it, make sure you only select the color and click bake. You will see a progress bar at the bottom of the screen. Once it's done you get a texture that combines all of the overlapping layers that now you can use as an input. If you want you can take it to the next level and use this baking approach in combination with nodes to generate a cool and complex looking node setup and then bake all of this into a single texture that you can use for exporting. When you're happy with your results, you can export it as GLTF just like the low poly model. Back in Godot we can import it. This time there should be no need to play around with the material settings, but each model will need its own material which will make everything last longer to render. So let's recap. You learned how to create materials for 3D models in any style and how to export and use it in Godot game engine. Benefits of the low poly approach would be Low workload, you can create decent looking models in short amount of time. Fast render speed, because every model can use the same material, especially for mobile games this can be a huge benefit. Downsides however are, needs extra geometry for more details, because you can only color complete faces and somewhat limited to a low poly style. On the other hand there is a texture paint approach. Benefits for this are more creative freedom, and you can draw in extra details without the need for extra geometry. Downsides are obviously each model needs its own material and the time for creating all of this is much higher. When using baking it gets even more higher and that's actually when programs like Surface Painter or some non-free Blender plugins come in very handy and help by simplifying the workflow by automating many steps in it. In the end you need to decide what suits best for you. For now all I have left to say is thank you for watching this video, I really enjoyed making it, despite the fact that it was actually a lot of work. It would be cool if you let me know if this actually helped you or if I rushed through some topics too fast and if you would like to see some parts of it in more detail. So for now get creative and have fun modeling some cool 3D assets, bye!